Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's be real here. The odds of Latvia being invaded by conventional Russian ground forces is extremely low right now. But the odds of Russia escalating the types of hybrid warfare that they've already been using against the country is incredibly high. With 35% of Latvia's citizens identifying as being ethnic Russians and 9% of Latvia's economic exports relying on Russia, this makes the country more vulnerable to the Kremlin's attempts at influence and the most likely place for a covert hybrid attack to occur. James Withers defines hybrid warfare in the 2015 edition of Military Balance. The use of military and non-military tools in an integrated campaign designed to achieve surprise, seize the initiative, and gain psychological as well as physical advantages utilizing- Okay, okay. Okay, I want a definition that we don't need a law degree to understand. Hybrid warfare is basically using economic or political power to hurt a country without firing a shot. In this episode, we'll address the types of hybrid warfare Russia is using against Latvia, how Latvia can defend itself, and are they employing the correct weapons and equipment? And we'll go into depth on their geopolitical importance to the Baltic region. Hey Spare Parts Army, this video is brought to you by our partner, the Ridge Wallet. You know as well as I do that most wallets have a limited shelf life before they start falling apart. If you buy the Ridge Wallet, you could carry one wallet for life. If commitment scares you, that's okay. There's over 30 different colors and styles to choose from. I already named my Ridge Wallet, so it's too late for me. I'm already emotionally invested. I named it Napoleon. Switching to this is like going from a flip phone to a smartphone. It makes your life more convenient because you're not stuffing old receipts in there. And it was a great icebreaker when I had to pull out my ID and show it to the cop that pulled me over. Just like how we've seen military equipment get upgraded and go from being made out of old materials like wood to being made out of durable new composite metals like aluminum and carbon fiber, the same thing has happened to wallet technology. Trust the 40,000 five-star reviews. The Ridge team will let you test drive it for 45 days and if you don't like it, you can send it back for a free worldwide shipping and returns. Click the link in the description or go to ridge.com slash task and purpose and use code TASK. To set the stage for Latvia, it's a small country of 1.9 million people situated in Northeastern Europe. But even the smallest of countries can play a disproportionately large role in world affairs. The country is about an hour and a half flight from Moscow. That's roughly the same as going from New York City to Florida. Latvia has borders with Estonia, Russia, Belarus, and Lithuania, which is like having two neighbors that you can't stand and two that you're kind of cool with. These facts combined with their small military size and its vast geographic distance from Western Europe create some really unique challenges for the country. According to Alyssa Tsarevnyov, a former contributor for International Affairs Review, if Russia was to reassert its dominance over Latvia, they would isolate Estonia and align Kaliningrad closer with the Russian mainland, which would be a huge problem for the NATO alliance. In this way, Latvia really is the geopolitical linchpin of the Baltic region and it's also the most vulnerable NATO ally. Now, a decade after it regained independence during the demise of the Soviet Union, Latvia was welcomed as a member of the European Union and NATO in 2004. Normally, those two organizations go hand in hand, like getting your CVS and Costco membership cards. Much like how here in America, we often view or describe each other as being either conservative or liberal, in Latvia, they see each other as either being pro-Russian or pro-Western. I assume the arguments between the two groups are just as productive. No! In fact, this very divide is cited as being the main potential concern for hybrid warfare that Russia could exploit. Andrew Radin's analysis on hybrid warfare in the Baltics for the RAND organization outlines how Russia could send in a significant amount of unmarked Spetsnaz troops to seize control of a city in Latvia and declare independence and then invite Russian forces into the country. Russia could arm and instigate a separatist element inside Latvia like they did in Ukraine. At this point, I'm thinking the same thing as you. What about NATO's Article 5 clause? If Latvia is attacked, then NATO would defend. Well, that's not necessarily true. According to Raiden's analysis, this kind of covert action would make it difficult for NATO to point to and say that it was Russian aggression, because these troops would claim to be Latvian. So how likely is this tactic to work? Well, fortunately, we have some data on this. Analysis believe it wouldn't work very well against Latvia because their economy is doing pretty well. So what are some of the major ways that Latvia's economy is vulnerable? Ever since leaving the USSR, Latvian ports have served as a key transit corridor for Russia by shipping through their maritime outlets and their oil pipelines. The entire enterprise represents around 9% of Latvia's total GDP. 
Russia's the fifth largest trade partner of Latvia. They've tried to make themselves inextricable from their economy. Roughly 40% of deposits in Latvian banks belong to non-residents, which means that this money is controlled by Russian-backed organizations. Now, I might be your average infantryman, not your average fiduciary, but even I know what that kind of economic hybrid warfare means. The Russian government could threaten to withdraw all that 40% of money from Latvian banks in a coordinated way, which would lead to a total and complete collapse of their banking sector. 40% sounds high, but remember that number was at 1.60%. So they've purposely taken steps to greatly reduce their exposure recently. I witnessed this fear firsthand when I was mobilized to Latvia in 2010 with my old unit. We were there to help train Latvian soldiers preparing to deploy to Afghanistan. When I spoke to their soldiers and the citizens in the capital of Riga, they all had the same concern. Would the United States come to their help if the Russians tried an invasion? In 2010, I thought this question was absurd. It turns out they knew something I didn't. This is obviously only my anecdotal evidence, but the impression I got was that soldiers and citizens there believed that the Russian government and oligarchs were investing millions of dollars into the Latvian economy, essentially trying to buy up influence in their country. This is why Latvia has been strategically reducing their economic exposure to Russia and their economy by 32% since its peak in 2013, when it was at 1.16 billion euros. At the end of the day though, it won't be the money that prevents an outside invasion, it will be their will to fight. The biggest thing to happen in the Latvian defense world is what's called the state defense concept. It was approved in September of 2020. The document outlines outlines a new defense strategy that the country would take, and it's kind of interesting because they plan on doing what's called total defense, meaning they would throw their entire population against any aggressive force. This represents a massive revolutionary change for their doctrine. Maris, the senior researcher at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, he claims there's one problem with this approach. Latvia is not willing to institute the draft. That would be one of the only ways to get enough manpower from your population to do this strategy. Their population size is important because it tells us the amount of total potential manpower that they can draw from in a worst case scenario. According to the open source intelligence estimates that we drew from, demographic projections in the CIA World Factbook, as of 2009, Latvia has 400,000 potential fighting age, able-bodied citizens to contribute to a major war effort. Let's see if the Latvian people are willing to go all hands on deck. In 2019, a survey found that 31% of respondents in Latvia say that they'd be willing to pick up arms and defend the country by any means. 55% are willing to fight in non-military ways. In order for the total defense concept to work best, you need to have about 10% of your population with some kind of military training. A RAND report explains some of the downsides of using this kind of total defense unconventional war strategy. Quote, Russian countermeasures could be overwhelming and might result in many civilian casualties and extensive damage to infrastructure. But Latvia has a pretty good justification for using their whole society. Latvian officials point out it's their only response to hybrid warfare threats. It's the only way that they could fight that unconventional warfare. They would require a bigger spectrum of tools that involve the entire society. They've already taken some steps in the right direction by choosing to induce state defense related courses into high school curriculum. So it's designed to improve the social responsibility, the societal cohesion, and it wants to give people the knowledge of the Latvian defense plan. Sort of sounds like a state-sponsored recruiting campaign where they go to schools and they try to kind of encourage people into joining the National Guard. I would love to see what the reaction would be if they tried a state-sponsored defense course in the United States. Might get people a little testy. If it works, it's a clever way of being able to go around having to do conscription. I think integrating the military with society and civilians is a great idea. A lot of times there's a disconnect, a gap of understanding between those two. At the same time, you do have to be careful because you want a clear distinction between the two. You want civilians in charge of the military. This way civilians can keep the military on a little bit of a leash. This footage here is from a training event last year that was actually kind of a controversial thing where the defense minister of Latvia had to apologize to the public because they ran this giant military exercise in uh, the capital of Riga. Shooting blanks around the capital city with this training exercise kind of upset some civilians. I guess we're not allowed to have any fun anymore. Here's some footage I took when I was in Latvia training for a month. Notice how we're walking around with guns through a suburban street, something you could never do in the United States. They were unloaded and we were alongside the Latvian military. We didn't go rogue. Just a very different cultural attitude towards the military there. 
but whether or not grandma picks up a rifle isn't gonna make the biggest of differences. So let's take a deeper look at Latvia's military forces and their people's dedication to their independence. Latvia is ranked 95 out of 142 military forces in the world on the global firepower scale, which of course does not account for NATO forces that would come to their aid. Latvia has switched to a professional army with the last draft being in 2005. Most of the analysis of Latvian military power has to be separated into pre and post 2014. Prior to that year, Latvia was seen as being a questionably small military. Since 2014, Latvia has embarked upon a major reform of its land forces. The country has modernized equipment and improved manning levels, readiness, and mobility. Instead of choosing to expand their forces into a large fighting force, they've invested their money in a really smart way. The greatest threat against them is hybrid warfare, which cannot be countered by adding more tanks. They have to be smarter than that with their limited resources. These priorities reflect Latvia's hesitant stance towards conscription, as well as their assessment that there wouldn't be any time for a large-scale mobilization in case of conflict. For many years between the 1990s to 2014, the country only spent about 1.5% and oftentimes as low as 0.94% of their annual GDP on defense spending because they had other economic problems that took priority. Since 2014, their spending has shot up to 2.2% and the defense minister said that he planned to hike defense spending to 2.5% by 2025, an additional 100 million euros. Today in 2022, their defense budget is $850 million. That amount buys them a total of 29,700 personnel, including a large majority of them being part-time soldiers who would be key in preventing the local kinds of covert hybrid warfare. 8,000 are National Guard, 3,000 are reserve soldiers, and the reason for them being heavy on reserve irregular forces is because these troops are stationed locally near their homes and they would be able to quickly react. There were a few ways to analyze how effective these troops would be to fight in a war. We saw in Afghanistan, partly because the people did not believe in their country's form of government, that their military folded quickly if you allow that oversimplification. A recent public opinion poll showed that 21% of Russian-speaking Latvians support Vladimir Putin's decision to send forces into Ukraine, and over half are undecided, which could mean that they're hesitant to admit that they support Russia and Latvia. But it isn't as simple as all that, because I believe Latvian people are strongly dedicated to the defense of their country and would rise to the occasion. Part of my evidence for this comes from a recent poll that shows that only 12% of Latvians say that other forms of government would be better. 67% of the country voted in favor of the EU membership in 2003, with an extremely high voter turnout at 72%. But keep in mind that this poll by the Public Opinion Research Center showed that 90% of Latvians support Ukraine, 1% support Russia, and 7% of neutral. So how has Latvia's military changed and reorganized to face this new reality and threats of hybrid warfare? They use what I call the porcupine defense. It's a tactic of investing into equipment that specifically will make your smaller forces seem bigger than they actually are. Let me explain. The Professional Army Brigade is stationed in Adazi, about 25 kilometers northeast of Riga. Its 1,500 soldiers are professional with the highest level of readiness in their military. It comprises of two lightly mechanized battalions, an artillery battalion also, and a combat support logistics battalion. On face value, they made a really strange choice with their armored vehicles. They have 116 of the CVRT armored reconnaissance fighting vehicles, which were all purchased from the UK's surplus arsenal in 2014 for about 46 million euros. These are the old 1960s era Western outdated vehicles. They were let go of by the UK because they were trying to phase them out because they were obsolete. So why is Latvia grabbing them up now? Another 82 are supposed to be delivered by the end of this year in 2022. I think part of the reason is because the Latvian army lacks the funds to maintain a large number of main battle tanks. So they don't need to fight hard, they need to fight smart. The CVR has half a dozen different variants that can fill different roles so Latvia can have a small light tank, an armored personnel carrier on the same chassis, thereby saving a ton of cost. They're also faster to get to the fight and require way less maintenance than a larger IFV like the Bradley or the Abrams. Think of it this way, the CVR weighs eight tons while your American Abrams and Bradley weigh 60 tons and 28 tons respectively. The CVR is tiny. 
the weight limit on the majority of roads in Latvia is 30 tons, and many bridges in Eastern Europe can't handle more than 55 tons. I don't think they could have found a better armored solution for the price that they paid. I think they went with the CVR because it can function as a kind of small light tank with a 105mm main gun. In light of this, since 2017, there has been a Canadian-led battle group deployed to Latvia, and they contribute some of the capabilities that the Latvian army currently lacks, most notably a handful of main battle tanks. Latvian planning includes scenarios that involve weeks of advanced warning, but they mainly assume that the time for preparation will be very short, perhaps 24 hours. They would likely not have a major warning of invasion due to the fact that Russia and Belarus often hold military drills at its border. There would be no easy way to tell the difference between a buildup and a regular training exercise. The CVR is the perfect vehicle for this kind of short notice massing of many troops instead of placing all their eggs into a few easy to hit expensive targets. So the CVR appears outdated and kind of is, it's also the right distribution of manpower to appear like a larger force. They can puff up like a porcupine and scare off any invading force. Internal infrastructure and maintenance for the advanced equipment is somewhat lacking, as evidenced by them sending the CVRs to UK for repairs. From 2019 to 2022, Latvia will spend 50 million euros on infrastructure annually. So what's the evidence that the Latvian soldiers have the will to fight? This includes their willingness to engage in every NATO mission possible. Since 1996, Latvian soldiers participated in operations in Bosnia. Latvia also contributed to NATO operations in the Balkans, Iraq, and Afghanistan. In the think tank research paper titled Russia's Influence and Presence in Latvia, Artur Bikovs points out that a lot has been said already about Putin's statement that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century. But not much has been said about the second part of Putin's statement, where he goes on to say tens of millions of our co-citizens and compatriots found themselves outside Russian territory. This is a major hint from Putin as to why Russian's foreign policy has been to undermine democracy in Latvia. I think the Kremlin genuinely believes that many of Russia's people have found themselves essentially trapped outside of the country due to no fault of their own, and that they rightfully belong under the Russian Federation protection. That's trying to understand their point of view. Alyssa Tresavnyov said hybrid warfare presents a unique danger in the modern day because it often weaponizes information to sow confusion and disorder through technological means. This brings us to my point. Latvia has faced constant Russian propaganda efforts to undercut their progress, so they've just this week decided to take drastic measures. On June 6, 2022, the Latvian government decided to ban all the Russian-based TV channels in the country after creating a law amendment that banned any media that, quote, threatened the territorial integrity and independence of another country. The average infantryman in me longs for the days when war was simply bombs and bullets that go boom. This could be seen by some as curbing free speech, while others view it as a necessary measure to prevent Russian influence in their country. You might think it wouldn't be a big deal either way to cancel Russian television, but take a look at how many people reported listening to Russian state-funded government-controlled TV in this survey. 49% is no small amount. The Latvian former foreign minister, Artis Papkrix, said in 2005, as an open society, Latvia cannot halt the flow of pro-Russian propaganda but it causes many problems for non-Latvians. Some of these people are torn apart, they don't know what to do. The problem of free speech is one that the entire world is struggling with right now, I think. I think Latvia is divided and unsure how to reconcile that on the one hand, they have this deep cultural heritage and background with Russia, and on the other hand, their country has this whole new identity in Europe that's going really, really well. It's my analysis that the Russian media in Latvia are straight up propaganda. Case in point, look at Russian billionaire Andrei Yankov, who tried to hide behind offshores, but was confirmed as the owner of two local Russian language newspapers inside of Latvia. How did he wiggle his way into the country? He purchased a 400 square meter flat in Riga for 1.5 million euros in order to get a golden visa in Latvia. His newspaper routinely runs pro-Russian talking points and only publishes opinions critical of the Latvian government and its EU policies. I'm sure there are some out there who would say that I'm biased towards the US, so aren't I propaganda? I'm not trying to deceive you, I admit my bias. This is an open forum where anyone can publicly disagree with me and oftentimes people in the comments are capable of proving my thoughts wrong. I admit that these are my opinions and no government is sponsoring me to say any of this, although I really wish they would. Come on Venezuela, I accept Bitcoin. Latvia censoring these foreign news outlets really does scare me because who's to say it won't use these new laws to crack down on press that they don't like? Democracy's greatest strength, like free speech, 
are at the same time its greatest vulnerabilities. So Latvia's defense procurements are guided by these two factors. First, by its intention to prevent a surprise attack. Second, by the limitations and realities of their budgetary limits of a small state. This latter factor means that they have to fight smart. They might not be able to invest their money into high value, high cost items, and it doesn't make sense to buy equipment that requires a lot of manpower to operate or maintain. Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania claim that the Baltic states are much safer now than at any point in history. Having an aggressive neighbor is nothing new to them, but being part of a defensive alliance like NATO is a first time experience. While Latvia and the two other Baltic states are not in immediate danger at this time, their security environment has been radically altered since February 24th, 2022. As the Latvian foreign minister recently pointed out, a new Iron Curtain is once again descending upon Europe. And while Latvia this time finds itself on the safe side, it does stand on the front line.